The Gospel of the Lord according to Mark chapter 1. Glory to you, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from uh, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to step down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came to Nazareth of, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens tore apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you, I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Today is what we call Baptism Sunday. This is the Sunday where churches around the world are reading the text about the baptism of Jesus, which happened eight days traditionally after he was born. This is also commonly known as one of the most boring Sundays in churches around the world. It's right up there, probably just beneath Trinity Sunday, when people come to church and usually pastors give a sermon about baptism, and people tend to fall asleep, especially lifelong church growers who would have been here, done that, heard this, and done whatever, and they're like, oh, okay, another sermon on baptism. Baptism has become one of those things that often in our lives, people know that they're supposed to do it, uh, it's a tradition, and it's something Grandma and Grandpa are always encouraging you to do, especially with your own children now. But actually, people have kind of lost sight of why baptism is so important. What's so special about baptism? Yes, they understand that it's kind of a, an initiation, right? It's, it's what connects us to God in some sense. Some people will say that it's, uh, it's uh, about being saved and all that. But oftentimes we're missing out on just the powerfulness of baptism because it's become just something you're supposed to do, like shoveling your snow when it hurts snows or thinking, writing a thank you card after Christmas. It's become kind of rote for so many people. That's why sometimes people come on this particular Sunday and they go, a sermon on baptism is coming, and so they get a little leery like, I know. So today I thought we'd go through the, the story that John shares with us and, and see if we can recapture some of the, the, the powerfulness of the story and try and figure out, is John trying to, or Mark, the gospel writer uh, that we read today, is he trying to communicate to something super important and relevant for our lives today, even for those of us who were baptized maybe 60, 70 years ago. So let's explore this story about John the Baptist that the uh, disciple Mark shares with us. It begins with this uh, proclaiming and this, this explanation that there was this guy named John. He was the cousin of Jesus, and he was baptizing large numbers of people in the Judean countryside. Now, uh, uh, just a quick uh, historical note about baptism. Baptism is not something new. It's something that's been around for about 100 years in Jewish culture and religious worship lifestyle. But it's something is going on in the moment, because baptism all of a sudden in the life of Israel has become a fad. It's become something lots of people want to do. Uh, and I kind of relate it to what happens after we have national tragedies here in America. Remember back 9-11? What happened in churches after 9-11? For about the next couple months, they were pretty full. If you can remember back, that's about 15 years ago. But if you think back just after hurricanes uh, or big national tragedies, people are reminded of their mortality. They're reminded that life is fragile. So what do you do when life is fragile? You go to church, right? At least for once or twice or three times, maybe. Because all of a sudden you realize, oh wow, life, life is precious. I need to make sure God fits into my life somewhere. And that usually lasts for a bit of time, and then let's face it, we get busy, and sometimes God gets pushed back to the back burner. You know how that goes in our culture, right? That's kind of what's happening in Israel. 
there's been a, two or three big tragedies that have gone on in the, in the life of Israel over the last 10 years. And it's reminded people that life is precious, life is fragile. They also look at the world around them and they see that they're being occupied by a foreign army. These foreigners are coming and telling them what to do and they restricted freedoms. So all of a sudden people are worried. Where is God? In fact, God's been conspicuously silent for 400 years. Maybe it's about time that God showed up. And if God's going to show up, then I want to be ready for him. And so this, this big fad begins. And I call it a fad because in that day and age, baptism became really, really popular. It's not just John the Baptist who is baptizing. It's happening all over Israel. In fact, it's becoming such a thing that there are certain religious communities that are doing it multiple times a day. They're being baptized every time they sin or every time they feel guilty. Why? Because it's a way of kind of just washing away the guilt and the sin and starting your life over again. It's kind of like, if I could put it another way, a New Year's resolution. I mean, how many of us make New Year's resolutions, right? Anybody? Is anybody? Come on, be honest with me. Does anybody make New Year's resolutions anymore these days? Is that something from like the 1980s or whatever, right? So it's like a New Year's resolution. That's what's going on in Israel at the time. People say, okay, I'm going to get the new start. I'm going to try again. And we all know what happens with New Year's resolutions, right? They last for like a week or two. And then we go back to the old way of living. That's what's going on in Israel. People are getting baptized. They're saying, okay, I'm going to make it straight with God. Life is fragile. I can see all around me all the problems. And then something happens, and then they have to get baptized again and again and again and again. That's what's going on in Israel. So in that culture of what's happening, all of a sudden, John the Baptist shows up. Now in these stories, there's several stories. Uh, John the Baptist is mentioned in all the Gospels. Uh, but especially in three of the Gospels, this story is very familiar. It's very similar. And there's certain elements that are always repeated in each of the stories about John the Baptist. And the first detail is this. You ever notice that it describes how he is dressed, how he looks, and what he's eating. He wears weird sacks of cloth of camel hair, and he eats locust and wild honey, and you always have this picture of this wild guy with a big beard and bugs growing in it, and he's living out in the desert, you know, a wild person, right? And we miss out on the point here. You notice how Jesus is coming on the scene, and no one ever describes how Jesus looked. We have no description of what physically, how he looked. Did he have a beard? Did he have curly hair? Did he have straight hair? Was it long hair? No, we have no idea what kind of clothes Jesus wore. It was never included in any description of Jesus. But every time John the Baptist is brought up, it's always brought up what he's wearing and how he looks. And so we have to ask the question, why? What's so special about John the Baptist that his clothes and the way he lives and his diet is mentioned every time he's brought up? And the thing is this, and it's something that we miss out on because of the day and the age that we live in. Back then, the Old Testament had ended 400 years before the life of Jesus. And the Old Testament ends with a very special verse. The very last word out of the last prophet in the Old Testament from God was this. And Elijah's going to come back. And in that great and terrible day, he will proceed coming to your Savior. And then that's it. 400 years of silence. That's the last two verses in the book of Malachi. And that's chronologically is the last book of the Old Testament. And then there's silence for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, boom, we have John the Baptist. And he's mentioned, even before Jesus is on the scene, we have the birth of Jesus. But then, you know, we don't know anything about Jesus growing up. And then his public ministry of Jesus starts with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is always mentioned as wearing camel hair uh, items and eating wild locusts and honey. But guess what? That's who else was described as wearing camel hair clothes and eating wild locusts and honey. Having a very special diet because he's part of a religious order called the Nazarenes. Elijah. So any person in the first century that's reading this story about John the Baptist, they are immediately going to make this mental image. <gasps> he's talking about Elijah. That's who this is. This is Elijah coming back. It's an attention here. It's going to grab their attention to let them know that this is important. What comes next, you got to pay attention to. It's what I call kind of an explosive moment in the story of Jesus. 
And there are certain moments in the life of Jesus as the gospel writers are, are, are writing, they're using tools to grab people's attention to say, hey, this is important, you need to pay attention. Because the words that come next, the words that John the Baptist always says in each telling of this, is that I'm unworthy, I can't untie this guy's sandals, but he's coming after me, and he's going to do something far more important. He's going to baptize you. With the Holy Spirit, which is a brand new concept, never been brought up before in the Old Testament. This is a brand new thought. How do you get baptized in the Holy Spirit? In fact, Matthew and Luke, in their retellings, they're going to say the phrase, He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. They're going to add in another adjective to help kind of entice people. Now, they don't explain what is going to happen. They just say, Hey, pay attention. Something powerful is going to happen. He is going to give you a different kind of baptism. And then to illustrate, because this is a new concept of well, what's going to happen, what it's going to look like, Jesus gets baptized. And why does Jesus get baptized? Does Jesus need to be baptized? Well, yes, Jesus says he does, but he needs to for different reasons than we do. Jesus gets baptized to show us how powerful baptism is and what it does for us. You guys know what steel is, right? You know how steel is forged or made? You take iron, you put it in a big flame, and you add some oxygen and oxidation processes that I don't understand. But what I do understand is this. You take iron, you heat it up, and you get rid of all of its impurities, and then what do you have left? You have steel. Something that's incredible, strong, bendable, malleable, can be used for to build things that will last for a long, long time. That's steel. You put it in fire, you get rid of its impurities, and something special comes out. It's kind of like with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is going to provide for us an altogether different kind of baptism. Not one that has to be repeated over and over and over again, but one with fire that's going to cleanse all the impurities out of us so that something incredible is remaining. And when that happens, something even more special happens. Because as Jesus is baptized, what happens afterwards? All of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes down and has this incredible announcement. You are my son. You are my child. You are beloved. And with you, I am well pleased. And this is why baptism is so special. Because of baptism, we get to hear the very same words that Jesus hears. You are my children. I, you are loved. And with you, I am well pleased. And it happens right away as we're baptized. Even as infants. Even as adults. No matter what choices we have made in life. No matter what choices we are going to make. Because of our baptism. Because of what Jesus has done. And the baptism that he gives us. God says to us all, you are my children. And I am especially in love with you. And you know what? I'm really happy about your life. I might not be happy about all the choices you're making. I'm happy about you, despite how you're dressed, or how you look, or what you might be doing yesterday, or what you might be doing tomorrow. You are my children, and I love you. We know that God loves us, theoretically. But so often in our lives, we really don't feel the majesty and the power that God is really pleased with who we are. He loves us spectacularly. And those same words that God said to Jesus, that's how God wants to say it to us. And how do we connect with God? Baptism is about becoming part of a family. It's an initiation, right? So that you are connected with God and you become part of God's family. Yes, all of that is true. But baptism is so special because of the fact that we get to hear these words because we are baptized by Jesus. Baptized by what Jesus has done, by the presence of God that has been opened up and is now living inside of our lives. You are my children. You are special. You are loved. And with you, I am well pleased. Amen. Amen. That's what baptism is so special. Let, because we get to simply hear those words. Let's stand for our song of the day.